So our next speaker today is Matt Patterson, who um, works in tech schools, I believe, and um, using the Donkey Car project in an educational context. So I'll be really interested to see how this is used by other people as well. Thank you, Matt. All right. Uh, thanks, John. So this uh, presentation is a story about a journey that I'm currently on uh, to improve the uh, teaching of our students in uh, STEM, or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which is a sort of big buzzword that people use a lot in education at the moment. Um, so it actually started about 20 years ago uh, when I volunteered um, at this com new computer clubhouse in Fitzroy, uh, helping the disadvantaged students in the uh, housing, nearby housing flats, uh, learning how to use robots and uh, also helping them making computer games in Python. Um, and I just thought, like, the, the sort of the format, it was all very project-based. Uh, there was no, like, lecturing, and I thought, you know, this is a great way to do things. Why don't we do this more in schools? Um, and then I just sort of sat on this idea for a long time, and nothing much happened. Uh, and I went, you know, I worked as a software developer, as an engineer, and then I ended up working at um, Melbourne Uni, uh, making these uh, multiplayer um, educational computer games. And I sort of got caught this bug of you know, being interested in um, education again and what's the best way to teach people and et cetera. And so then I went back and I trained as a teacher um, and worked at a school for a bit. Um, and then I got a job at these uh, They've just released these uh, tech schools over the last couple of years. Um, and around the same time as I did this, um, as I started working at this tech school, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, I found out about these uh, donkey cars. And to me, this seemed like a great opportunity uh, to teach people in a really hands-on way uh, where you learn by doing uh, rather than necessarily being, being lectured. Um, it's, a, it's a new technology, uh, people know about it, it's sort of, um, uh, yeah, kids are interested in it. Uh, it's relatable to students. Um, the students have, um, you know, opportunity to learn a whole lot of skills, and also it's based on some pretty uh, open and widely used technologies like uh, Raspberry Pi, Python, uh, webcams and uh, RC cars. I know when I was uh, growing up, I was quite interested in RC cars. Um, so what are the tech schools uh, where I'm working? Uh, it was established and funded uh, in 2015 by the Victorian government. Uh, so it's a government uh, initiative. Uh, they've introduced 10 uh, tech schools uh, across Victoria. Uh, the school that I work at, the Yarra Rangers Tech School, was the first one to, uh, to be operational. Um, it's a model of uh, sort of uh, delivery of uh, STEM skills um, at a specialised facility. So uh, we don't have our own students. Uh, we bring in students from the surrounding area, and they come in for specialised um, uh, activities. And uh, the uh, schools and students get access to facilitators uh, with experience working in industry in STEM fields. Um, so where I work, the Yarra Rangers Tech School, uh, we have 20 feeder schools that all come uh, and send their students to us. Uh, and the students uh, visit for like day-long excursions. Uh, but they usually come you know, three or four times per year. So you do get to know the kids uh, over time. And then they'll come back again the next year and the next year. Um, they do one activity or, or uh, design brief per visit. Um, and each challenge will usually focus on you know, one or two technologies like you know, Arduino or Little Bits or some kind of robotics or virtual reality. Um, yeah, and so we try to deliver uh, this sort of STEM education in an engaging way. Um, so this, uh, around the time that I started at the tech school, I went to this uh, little conference, and this is what I was, this is like, this is like um, so this was like the executive director of two of the tech schools. He was like a senior uh, person in the Department of Education. 
Um, and so that was his perspective. Uh, and I'd just been working uh, in a school as like a science and maths teacher, so I could understand a little bit. Uh, I think especially around the years that we're targeting, which is year eight to year 10, uh, there is often uh, a lot of uh, disengagement in, uh, in schools at the moment. So um, I don't know if any of you have had teachers like this. I can see if you, oh, what's going on here? I kind of lost it. I want to play this. Ah. There's no sound. I'll just be a second, pardon? Ah, it's not my computer. But... We might have to just go with that if we can't find them. All right, anyway, you get the idea. Pardon? No, no, no. Look, can one of you guys, you guys probably know it. Yeah, that's the one. Anyone, anyone? Anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of funny. So this is sort of how not to teach STEM, but it, unfortunately it is sometimes the way it's taught. And this is sometimes how the kids look in the class. All right, so how should we teach STEM? So I think, uh, you know, and there's like developing experience and evidence um, that we want to encourage students' uh, problem-solving skills and their design thinking, so the way that they, uh, you know, not just like solve a maths problem, but actually design a solution. Uh, they, uh, it often helps with engagement if there's some kind of real-world context of what they're doing. Um, and rather than having, like what we saw on the last slide, like, you know, just different silos, like there's a science class where you learn science, and a maths class you learn science, maths, and if you're lucky, there's an IT class. Um, you know, really drawing everything together and not having these artificial boundaries, and it's more just about uh, solving some kind of project. And project or design-based. So this is, this is the way we try to do everything at the tech school. Um, how to engage students, just some things that we've found. I don't know if any of this is scientific, it's more like things that we've found. Um, uh, the more hands-on an activity is, uh, the better, uh, especially for a lot of, you know, year, not, year eight, year nine uh, boys. Um, some kind of real problem that they're solving, uh, you know, some kind of uh, something that students can relate to. Um, and, you know, something that, like, the difficulty... <laughs> Uh, that it's challenging to students, but it's not too challenging. So we often throw kids right in the deep end, like programming Arduino um, in Arduino C or Python, uh, uh, you know, SSHing into Raspberry Pis and things like that. Um, and so that could overwhelm the students, but the way we do it is we start them off with very step-by-step -step instructions uh, so that, um, you know, they can develop their confidence and then once they've developed their confidence, then they're free to sort of go off and do things in their own way. Um, and then also, we just seem to find that if there's some kind of game element, then that takes kids to a, a, a bit of a higher level of enthusiasm. And so this is one of the games that we've created. Um, uh, it's like a sort of old school retro uh, with the um, retro music and whatever. Um, yeah, while they're uh, heating up, um, uh, they're making these um, energy efficient houses and they're waiting for a few minutes for the houses to heat up. And while they're waiting, waiting, they're got all this music playing and they're part of a game. Uh, some of the activities we do, um, I'll just go through a couple. So there's the one with wearable electronics, by, where by the end of it they have their electronics, uh, which is like little bits 
an Arduino sort of attached to their bodies and their, um, uh, when they demonstrate them. Uh, uh, robots uh, navigating a maze. This one is actually a little bit similar to um, Donkey Car, but a lot simpler. Uh, we've got these um, dog robots and um, humanoid robots. They sort of stand on their head and do flips and all sorts of things. Um, yeah, and we have some Raspberry Pi and Python activities like this. Uh, they create a, students create a voice activated chatbot, like in a supermarket, and they do farm monitoring. Um, all right, so I'll just quickly talk about this, uh, this Ringo Arduino programming activity. This is one that I've spent quite a lot of time working on and delivered a lot of classes in. Um, and it's basically uh, this little robot uh, going around a maze. Uh, and it starts off with a small maze, and then when they get it through that, a bigger maze. And then finally we have uh, a maze going across the whole room, uh, and we turn off the lights, and they've got uh, lights flashing on their robots, and they do some racing. Um, and yeah, and the kids seem to really, um, it's just very simple activity, but the kids seem to really like it. And so if we look at what we're going to do with donkey cars, it's probably going to start off being quite similar to this um, uh, Ringo robots. So you know, we're going to assemble a car compared to just connecting the robot. We're going to name the, you're going to name your car. That's what we often get kids to do. They, then they get a sense of ownership. Uh, you're going to be, uh, do calibration. Uh, do some graphing of the calibration values, uh, you know, drive around the track uh, versus programming the robot to navigate through the maze uh, and, and training the car to follow the lines. And then we're also thinking about uh, some kind of like lights or sounds or something that we can add on to the Raspberry Pi uh, just so that uh, some kids want to race and some kids just want to make their car look cool. Um, and so we want to try and have these multiple entry points that people with different interests can do the same activity in a different way and both enjoy it. Um, and yeah, that's just looking at some of the skills that they're learning while they're sort of having fun. Um, all right, so that's, that's like the first activity that we're hoping to do with the students. Uh, and by the way, if you can think about any ideas that you have, we're still, we still haven't finalized what we're going to do. So I'm very much interested at the end to hear your feedback. Um, so the, the next thing is we want to get kids to think, start thinking about logistics uh, and supply chains and um, you know, moving. I think these are some good skills for kids in about year 10 to be thinking about. So I'll just. Oh, no, I can't do this because there's no sound. That's okay. I'll just play a little bit. So uh, anyone knows that when you buy something from Amazon, uh, a lot of the warehouses are actually uh, all you know, uh, managed by robots. Um, and so people don't, you know, I think a lot of changes are going on in our world, and people don't actually realize it. And so when you buy something from Amazon, you don't realize that it's all being um, uh, moved around in the warehouses by these little cool little robot things. Um, so what we want to do is um, create some kind of logistics activity. Uh, so this would be for people who've already done the basic, uh, the introductory activity. Um, and what we're going to do is, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, uh, get the students, um, So imagine they've got a car with a, like a box on top, and then we want to put an ultrasonic sensor that detects whether there's anything in the box. 
And then when you go and put something into the box at the loading point, then it will recognize it and it'll automatically transport that to the delivery point, um, which, um, and then you can unload it, you know, and then at the delivery point it'll get unloaded and then it would either go back empty or it would be loaded up with something else. And the idea is, um, and so the activity could be something like uh, uh, robots moving around hospital supplies in a hospital, something like Amazon deliveries or your Uber Eats or uh, there's all sorts of possibilities. Uh, but uh, what we'd really like is for the students to be able to um, form sort of big teams you know, so like, uh, you know, one team at, at one end of the supply chain, one team at the other end, um, and then they're working together and competing against other teams uh, to see how many, you know, how much uh, product they can um, transport. Yeah. No. So the way it generally works at the tech school, because like we have like. Uh, five or six thousand students come. But we can't really afford to to give every one of those kids at one of those cars, so they just use it for the day, and then we'd sort of take it apart again in the next. Yeah. Uh, that's that. Um, other activities, you know, and again, we're just still thinking about what uh, what we'd like to do. I think there's quite a few opportunities. Um, one would be some kind of like system design challenge where you, you sort of add or modify features um, to the car. Um, another would be, this is like the ideal sort of thing that I think would be pretty cool, but you know, uh, not sure if it'll ever happen. Uh, some kind of industrial automation challenge. We also want to get um, these robot arms and conveyor belts. Um, and if there was some way to combine together the donkey cars driving back and forward and some robot arms uh, picking things and, and putting them in the, in the box or whatever, uh, then, you know, that's sort of like an aspiration. Um, and there's, quite, there's some quite interesting um, uh, robot arms that are coming out these days that are quite um, becoming a lot more affordable. Now, where did my thing go? Uh, pardon? Uh, I can just restart it, maybe. I can just start it up again. Yeah, I'll just do it again. Cool. Um, no. Uh, so I'll stop that. Um, Sorry guys, I'm not sure what happened there. All 
All right. Um, so why do, why do we care about creating these uh, sort of uh, real-world um, hands-on activities for students? Why do we care? Um, I think the thing is that today, technology affects every field, so it affects every person in our society. They're all going to grow up over the next, these students are going to grow up over the next, um, you know, uh, 50 years uh, using technology every day. Pardon? Oh, computer graphics. Yeah. Yeah. So that is, yeah. Yeah, uh, and so a lot of this stuff is relevant. This is just a small sampling of, of uh, things like Amazon. Uh, Amazon's got their own uh, deep racer, by the way, which is very similar to Donkey Car. Um, so they're getting involved in this. Uh, you know, Uber and Lyft, uh, they're obviously working on their own uh, self-driving Ubers. And uh, Google and Waymo and Tesla are all working on self-driving cars. And I think... Uh, this sort of uh, self-driving technology is also very useful for um, logistics and uh, truck driving and things like that. Um, yep, all right, cool. So that's basically it. Um, you know, it's uh, basically the reason why we should, um, the reason why, one of the reasons why we should um, learn about uh, these sort of activities is that uh, it's relevant for everyone, but for some people who uh, might be interested in following some sort of computing um, uh, career, uh, there is actually um, some uh, potential financial benefits uh, and benefits to society from people doing that. Um, and when we talk about the STEM uh, the STEM problem that we, people are talking about, we need people learning more about STEM, a lot of it is actually in computer science. So a large proportion of the new these STEM jobs that people talk about are all in computing, whereas only 8% of um, uh, STEM graduates are actually currently studying computer science. Uh, and parents want their kids to learn about computer science, even though the high schools don't teach it. Uh, Computer science courses at high school are actually uh, some of the most popular courses. Uh, and in terms of uh, diversity issues, where currently we have very few, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the, um, the news about Google and Yahoo and some of these companies not having many uh, women in their workforce. Um, and we can actually start to solve these issues in the school uh, because women who try computer science in high school are 10 times more likely to major it in college, and people from minority backgrounds are seven times more likely. Anyway, so should we just go to break now? Is there anyone? Anyone? Thank you very much, Matt.